Hey, Slick Talkers, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast, and I know that if you love this show, you'll also love my morning show called Good Morning Hospitality with my co-hosts Michael Golden and Brandy Canale as we spend 30 minutes every Monday morning to dive into the industry's top latest news and trending topics. So go check it out on wherever you find your podcasts at Good Morning Hospitality, and you can live stream with us on Monday mornings on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, YouTube. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode. And so I do think each listing site brings something to the table that they owe the industry and they owe the industry stakeholders. What I have brought to the to those stakeholders with ours is this unique selling proposition really of we want to positively impact stays here and we want to positively impact the idea of a stay there even before it occurs. And so somebody that's researching a destination will hopefully come across our content and be more likely to visit the, the destination. So these aren't just the people that are searching Gatlinburg cabins, for example. These are the people that are searching like, hey, where would I go hiking in the Smokies? Or where would I do this or that? And we want to positively impact that journey with video content and photographic content and these insider tips and really just drive that additional demand that may not have occurred otherwise, not unlike the, the Super Bowl ad by Airbnb, but hopefully a more grassroots version of that, that that's there to stay a little bit longer is, is really what I would say is our, our differentiator slash what we bring to the, to the industry ultimately. You're listening to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, a podcast for those who are in and around the hospitality industry who love, live, and breathe what they do. You can join us for candid and unscripted conversations with hospitality experts and founders as we go deeper into their personal stories while they're sharing their triumphs and trials that got them to where they are today. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and you're listening to an episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. Now, let's begin. What's up, Slick Talkers? This episode is brought to you by my friends at Minute. And if you haven't heard of Minute, then guess what? They are the perfect co-host solution for your technology stack. Here's why I call them your co-host solution is because they can be the best alerting system for you if there's too many guests at your property or if there is a party that breaks out. And guess what? Their sensors are amazing. You don't get any false positives as in dogs barking, the wind blowing, maybe a door slamming or a glass breaking, that doesn't trigger an alert. Real party noises actually trigger an alert. So that way you're not getting woken up in the middle of the night or alerted in the middle of the day for nothing. They have two outdoor sensors and these sensors do not need to rely on each other in order to work. So if you are worried about outdoor parties and your neighbors getting interrupted, then just get the outdoor sensor. If you're worried about big parties inside your really big vacation home, then get the indoor sensors so that way you can make sure you're covering all the common spaces that you need to. There's a special offer for all Slick Talkers in the show notes below. And now back to the episode. All right, Slick Talkers, welcome back to another episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. And I am brought to you by a marketing legend. And if you don't know this guy's name, I would be surprised because every time I bring up his name, everyone has the most nicest things to say. So David Ngati, my friend, welcome to the podcast. How are we doing today? Man, doing well. Thanks for having me on. Super excited to be here for the first time. It's been, I've I've been a long time listener, so glad to be here on the other side of the table. Long time listener, first time guest, you know, just making waves in 2023. I love it. That's right. Well, David... I want to dive into your story. If you've listened, you, know, you just said you have. So listening to the podcast in the bat in the past, you understand that we love to cover stories and people's origins to them making the moves and companies and visions they have today. I would say just to wrap it up and summarize it nicely. You're a serial entrepreneur. So for you, I want to know what was the beginning? Like where does that first seed get planted with you? Because that I find the most interesting. Oh man, if we're going to go to the beginning, uh, we, ha- we have to go way, way back. And I actually wrote a blog post on this a long time ago, but it was my first job. And I was about six and a half years old. My brother was a year and a half, two years old. And 
all the friends in California where I was growing up were going down to this little store called the Egg Ranch and uh, <laughs> buying candy. And my parents didn't believe in allowances or anything like that. They're like, hey, get out there and earn your money, even to me as a six or seven year old kid. So I came up with this idea of charging my friends to watch my brother eat dog food and uh, <laughs> talk to my brother into it. I said, hey, bud, if you'll just eat this dog food, I'll give you 50 cents or something. And I charged each of the friends a quarter. They all came in and watched. He gets sick about halfway through eating the bowl <laughs> of dog food. And so I charged anybody extra that wanted to stay and watch him get oh, sick. And, uh, oh. and, you know, that was the roots of uh, Stay Sense today. No, I'm kidding. Uh, the story's <laughs> true. But, you know, hopefully learned a few more lessons along the way to where, the, where we are today. But that was really the first taste of entrepreneurism. And it was like, wow, I can leverage uh, this idea in somebody else's time. And I can turn that into money. And then I went and bought candy with it and life was good. So that was the very beginnings. Of course, then there were some iterations after that. I'm hoping there's some iterations after that. Your poor brother. <laughs> Man, yeah, I've yeah. never, my face hurts from smiling already on this episode. So that's the funniest story I've ever heard for anyone getting into entrepreneurship. Uh, man, that's too good. That is too good. So <laughs> I have this image burned in my brain now, of this kid eating dog food and getting sick. A bunch yeah. of kids laughing at him and be like, yeah, go Tom. Yeah. Or who, who, who is your brother's name? <laughs> yeah, his name's uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan Angotti now. He's a, oh. uh, a doctor. But, you know, that that brings him back down to his place, I think. He hates when I tell this story. So the more times I can tell it on podcasts or anywhere where it gets mass uh, distribution, then great. Yeah, that's, wow. You've spoken like a true brother. Spoken like a true brother, that is. Okay, so... <laughs> You, you got that taste of entrepreneurism at a very young age, the most interesting way. Evolving into, let's say, phase two, what was one of the first businesses that you started and was like, this is a business, not just to yeah. get candy, but this is a bit yeah. like, you're like, I'm going to make money and we're going to do this thing and whatever it might be, but kind of give us maybe that first experience from yeah. uh, going yeah. into the, the dog food days. Yeah. So uh, I was in high school and I'd had a, like a yard mowing business and some other businesses, the, the normal, you know, stories that most people would, I, I guess, tell when they're talking about like, Hey, how'd you make your first little bit of money? And yeah. I'm sitting at a Wendy's and I overhear a realtor talking on the phone about how she can't get anybody out to these houses that she's listing in exclusive neighborhoods and how much she's willing to pay for window washers and how there's just nobody out there that will do it. And so I went over to her after she got off the phone and it's like, hey, I, I didn't mean to eavesdrop on you, but I just wanted to let you know I have a window washing business. I didn't. And I can be there for you whenever you need me to. And I'll make sure this gets done. And I just heard her talking about the prices. So she was like, hey, how much does this cost? I basically reflected the pricing. She'd just been yelling into the phone during the phone call. And so from that, the window washing business was born, which then ended up being, uh, we called it D&Ds in, in high school. We ended up with about 30 part-time employees. We had the yard care, the mobile uh, detailing business that did commercial fleets and stuff. And then we also had the the window washing business. And so like that was the beginning of like realizing, hey, we can go from just mowing yards like everybody does to an actual business. And then once I figured that out, the rest was kind of history. That's insane. In high yeah. school, you had 30 part time peeps just doing all sorts of different business stuff. And you're like, all right, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was like we were all pretty immature and it wasn't like I made a fortune or anything. Most of the money got blown on, uh, you know, different yeah. things that you do in high school. And so then, uh, you know, it was it was a lot of fun and brought all the friends into the mix, which is like the worst possible idea for business. But it, it yeah. was fun at that time and taught me some more good lessons. Yeah, I was going to say the lessons learned from that are probably invaluable and have applied to where you are today. So with that, how did you get exposed into vacation rent? Going from yeah. doing multiple you know, entrepreneurial things outside of the industry, what was the exposure? Yeah, so I've always loved to travel. So the first time I booked a vacation rental was actually for my honeymoon, which was in 2004. And we booked this place in Hana, Maui. It was awesome. VRBO was just a, a listing site that you'd get on and you'd haggle back and forth with the owner. You kinda, It wasn't transactional at all or anything. The dates that were shown on the calendar weren't even available. But once I got there, and actually had a chance to experience the property. I was hooked on vacation rentals right then. So fast forward a few years, we had an educational technology company that we were able to exit. 
And so we bought some vacation rentals out in the Smokies. And that's where the story of the professional side of vacation rentals came in because like I got that exposure of being a homeowner. I got that exposure of working with different property management companies. And from that, I kept thinking, man, somebody has got to be able to do everything that I think is possible with this business model that I'm seeing in front of me. Yet each company that I would try fell short in one area. They didn't get all the areas right. And so I like to call that chapter of life naive optimism. So I looked at this market with, you know, 400 or so property managers in it and thought to myself, no experience. I can do better than all of them. And uh, (laughs) so jumped straight in and and tried to do that. And that was in 2013 that we started thinking, hey, we're going to go into property management and actually do this professionally instead of just with a few properties we own. Was that SmokyMountains.com? Yeah. So uh, we we had already purchased uh, SmokyMountains.com, the domain name. We hadn't really built out a brand on it yet at that point. Back then, Wes Melton and I were still business partners at that point, or Mm -hmm. we were just starting our business together at that point. And so we were like, hey, let's do property management. A couple of tech guys, what can go wrong? And, (laughs) uh, you know, we would spend the next two years, three years answering that question. But it was it was a fun ride. We grew it to about, I think it was 130 or so properties over about two years or so. And there was a lot of lessons along the way, but also a lot of fun. Well, two tech guys are able to scale to 100 plus in two years. It's pretty impressive. I would say we've had a lot of people on the show that have said like, it's taken me 10 years, 20 years, however many long to get to a certain point. And I, I'm always impressed by the people that can get past 100 within such a short period of time. So with that learning for you guys and, and you bought the domain, when did you start building the brand and, and kind of getting to that point where, because I correct me if I'm wrong and I can totally edit stuff out. And if any listeners yeah. are hearing me say this, know that I didn't edit it out, but it's like you get to the <laughs> point where you're able to sell that business and continue to own the domain though, and become yeah. more of a listing site rather than an operator. So I guess kind of tell yeah. us that transition period. Yeah. So basically it was, it was realizing quite honestly, that this was a lot of work. We were going to have to yeah. meet with the city and all these owners meetings and, you know, balancing these two sets of customers and then all the connections between those two sets of customers, your, your homeowners and your guests, and really wanting to do an exceptional job at each, which made us the breaking point in between the two ultimately. And so along the way, we did grow very rapidly and we realized over time that the high level of both customer service for the guests as well as the owner services just wasn't going to be scalable potentially to where we wanted it to go. Simultaneously, we built this brand, SmokyMountains.com. We'd actually started building that brand before we even knew how we would monetize it. We knew this mission we had, which was we wanted to positively impact every single vacation to the Smoky Mountains region, which was like this huge, audacious goal. We get about 20 million vacations uh, or 20 million people visit the area each year on vacation. So this idea that, hey, we're going to start from not impacting anybody and impact every last one of them was this huge goal, but it was also a guiding principle for us. And so every decision we made got filtered through that guiding principle of, hey, is this actually making better vacations for people? Because we felt like if we could just do that, the whole area would benefit ourselves included. And so that's what we really started to to process through as we realized, hey, we're out unclogging a toilet or we're meeting with a city and an engineer about a deck that may or may not be safe. And, you know, all these things like that. And we realized this may not be the best path to reach that that end goal or the guiding principle that we'd set for ourselves. Around the same time, I met Ben Edwards with Weatherby Consulting. We were down at a, a conference having a couple beers and Ben was like, hey, so how are you liking property management? And I'm like, not very well, actually. And so he's laughing and he's like, well, you know, if you wanted to sell it, I could sell it for you in a month or two. And I'm like, Really? Hmm. Sure. Okay. Let's talk more. So after the conference, I thought he was full of it and this wasn't going to actually happen. So after the conference, he reaches out and we talk some more. And then sure enough, that's, he had us under uh, an LOI within about six weeks of the day I met him with Steve Milo and and now B-Trips who came in and bought the company from us or the owner contract specifically from us and let us keep the technology yeah. behind and operate as a listing site. Yeah. So it's pretty, okay. This is where I get excited because it's very much, I don't know if you saw this. Did you see this as like, okay, we're going to operate this brand instead. This is obviously where my passions lie. Or did it accidentally through that conversation with Ben being like, 
yeah, I'm not liking property management, to be honest. Like it's a lot of tedious stuff and a lot of dirty work with, of course, housekeeping and taking care of owners and sat- trying to satisfy a whole lot of people, especially if you have over a hundred homes, we only have yeah. 10 and I can only imagine amplifying that times 10 and be like, Holy crap. I'd be like, no way. <laughs> so did you kind of accidentally stumble into create just like, okay, I'm going to sell this. And did you ever think like, what am I going to do afterwards? Or did you immediately go to, I'm going to run this brand now. I'm going to continue to own the domain while yeah. making a monetary, you know, there's a lot of pieces with that. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's the first time I've actually ever been asked that question out of all the panels I've been on. And, you know, was this accidental or did this happen on purpose? And I'd say it's a little bit of both. So I knew I wasn't going to just give the brand to somebody that came along and bought the inner contracts. And so like, okay, if we're going to keep the brand, how do we monetize that? And it was a pretty logical step as somebody that had been paying commissions to the different listing sites and also knew what we were capable of booking just based on how many bookings we were driving ourselves. We knew that there was opportunity here. And then through the acquisition process, when Steve acquired the homeowners from us, he basically guaranteed to be a customer of it and also mm-hmm. believed there was a business there as well. And so that was pretty good validation straight out of the gates. And so, uh, which he, he was customer number one for us and, and continues to be a great customer to this day. Mm-hmm. And so it's one of those things where we had this asset that we knew was worth something. We knew the path to monetizing the asset, and then we had a near instant validation. And, and so from there, it's like, okay, we need to start working on integrations with technology companies. We need to start really refining the tech. We need to figure out how to drive bookings for thousands of properties instead of a hundred properties. So there were a lot of challenges to still overcome, but we had a really good foundation to build upon. Well, it's funny because it's like full circle, two tech guys go into property management and they come out the other side as tech guys again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, I, I don't know what that tells us all, but it tells us something. <laughs> hey, so. riches and niches as Brooke Fox would say, riches and niches. That's what, yeah. you know, he always preaches that message down my throat. So I do love though, how you talk about, you know, the impact, right? Like, okay, we're able to make an impact on our guests, but now you're going from zero to 20 million in a year for that whole destination. I love it because it is such a big mission statement, but with a scalable business of creating a listing site, such as smokymountains.com, that in itself is achievable. Like that's, it's not like a out of the water goal, but it's actually within your reach. So kind of walk me through this. Now you've gone through the sale, Steve automatically, who has been a guest on the show. So anyone listening who hasn't listened to his episode, go back, show note links are all there. Etc. But you know, you get to that sale, you have instant validation, you're building out this tech, realizing you need to integrate, you need to do this other stuff. How has that gone? It's gone really well, but I do think it's important to actually rewind to back during property management days. The whole reason we had this asset that was worthwhile to carve out when we sold off the homeowner contracts to Steve was we had done things like hire a full-time photographer who she was out mm-hmm. hiking the trails and taking photos of it. She was visiting every attraction in town, whether it be a, a, a restaurant or a mirror maze or whatever it might be. The hundreds and hundreds of attractions we were, were out there and we're sending photographers, we're sending locals to go out and write professionalized reviews. And so we found this need for something beyond what TripAdvisor had to offer, where you know you have four sentences that are grammatically incorrect and you have photos that are sideways or blurry. Well, we found that like from, from talking with actual guests that go to these points of interest that they wanted a better, like more expert, like an author that understood what it's like to actually visit this and could give advice almost as if it were a friend that they were giving the advice to. And so we started to create this format that really worked for basically distilling the most important information and putting that in the hands of vacationers in the area, whether or not they booked with us. So we called that like the bottom line, which was basically TLDR. And it's right there at the top of every point of interest review. We had the professional photos. We had the insider tips, which those are the tips that somebody wouldn't know, even if they get on TripAdvisor or something else. You have to be local to know a lot of these tips that are on there. Mm -hmm. And all that together created this content marketing foundation That was all there when we were in property management. We did these in parallel and probably part of why we were so stressed out trying to build that brand, which really ended up being a whole nother brand alongside building a property management brand and doing it both pretty rapidly. And so 
as you, you know, and I've done lots of keynotes and presentations on how to build traffic. That's not the point of this, but like, as you build this over here, you also have to build coverage for it and basically generate uh, authority in the eyes of the search engines. So we did that through a few very authoritative pieces that ended up getting nationwide coverage from hundreds and hundreds of newspapers and and media channels. So we were doing TV interviews, all kinds of stuff, and then driving that traffic and driving that authority into the site, which would ultimately be what would lift every point of interest and in every listing on the site. And so that was all happening back in property management days. Once we were able to, to sell off the listings or the owner contracts to Steve, now all of a sudden we can focus in on it. And so that let us scale faster, where we were going after additional points of interest a little bit quicker, and then also really just dial in on the technology integrations with property management softwares, whether it's, you know, track or streamline or guesty or whoever it might be, you have all these different property management softwares and you really need every last integration, which just isn't possible. So then you also go after some of the channel managers, like whether it's booking pal or rentals, United, some of those different ones that are out there on that front too. So that's what really all of the next 18 months ended up being about was that. And then the business development side of let's get a bunch of listings on this site. Now that we have a listing site. I love this story because it, it's very relatable to what we've done with our podcast network. And that's why I find so much like joy from this conversation. It's like, Oh dude, this is another application of someone doing it in a completely different way, but within the same methods, if that makes sense. Yeah. And as you and I know, you know, getting that traffic from TV interviews and all this other stuff drives so many backlinks and getting that coverage, like the amount of backlinks and the authority, like you're talking about, it just resonates with me. I love it. So yeah. very exciting. So now you're probably like me because when Slick Talk, this podcast got traction and I was like, all right, well, we're, we're going full time and I went full time and then we launched a network. That's when I was like, there's something here and we need to duplicate it. And so for you with smokymountains.com, I know you never stop building, right? Like it's still continuing right. to grow and to be redefined and, yeah. and tweaked with, but now you see, you can do this with other places, right? You see that yeah. this is something that no one else is doing. Why yeah. not yeah. go to other markets? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, I kind of think about it almost a little bit differently on the listing site side of things. It's, you know, each listing site has, hopefully a service to the property management community, to the homeowners, to the different people that are out there, whether they're guests, all of the stakeholders in this industry. So for example, you take a company like Airbnb and I get it. Some people want to make them out to be the bad guy, the company that's, that's, that's not the best, but you know what they have done is they popularized vacation rentals to a level they weren't before. And yeah. we, we can, we can sit around and talk about whether or not that would have happened with or without them. I would, I would say, no, they were the ones that made it transactional at the beginning. They were the ones that had Super Bowl ads before anybody else had Super Bowl ads for this space. And it really made it to where all of a sudden, you know, people like my mom had heard of vacation rentals instead of just people of my generation and below. And so I do think each listing site brings something to the table that they owe the industry and they owe the industry stakeholders. What I have brought to those stakeholders with ours is this unique selling proposition really of we want to positively impact stays here and we want to positively impact the idea of a stay there even before it occurs. And so somebody that's researching a destination will hopefully come across our content and be more likely to visit the, the destination. So these aren't just the people that are searching Gatlinburg cabins, for example. These are the people that are searching like, hey, where would I go hiking in the Smokies? Or where would I do this or that? And we want to positively impact that journey with video content and photographic content and these insider tips and really just drive that additional demand that may not have occurred otherwise, not unlike the Super Bowl ad by Airbnb, but hopefully a more grassroots version of that that's there to stay a little bit longer is, is really what I would say is our, our differentiator slash what we bring to the industry ultimately. And so that's the different listing sites. We do have like Florida and Hawaii now, in addition to the Smokies, which, you know, it's been a new challenges each place we go, obviously. And, and those challenges are, as you know, as somebody who's building things, that's part of what we live for. We need those who are like challenge junkies and then you push past it and you feel great. But, you know, it's um, we're real excited about a new product that is just coming out uh, that will actually bring bookings to really any website that's out there. It's going to be targeted primarily at CBBs and DMOs. 
And so basically those huge destination marketing organizations that right now represent hotels, but underrepresent the vacation rental segment, we're just now in the process of launching that product and, and bringing that to the first couple of those. And we think that that's, again, back to that whole grassroots thing, a way to bring additional light onto the industry and additional bookings really at a very low cost for property managers. Well, the biggest difference too with Airbnb and what I'm just seeing from kind of like this conversation in general, Airbnb does a really good job of Super Bowl ads. Yeah, covering the industry, right? It's just as a booking platform. But your big differentiator and why I like it so much is because you're actually highlighting a specific destination rather than a global idea of travel, right? Travel is great in the thinking of you can book an, a property on Airbnb and go experience something really cool. But if you're ideally looking for the Smoky Mountains or Hawaii or Florida, this is more intentional on the sense of capturing that rather than just the idea of travel, capturing the idea of your trip at that place in this home on that hike, you know, at this restaurant, that's more granular. And I want to ask you a question and it's completely something I've actually never asked anybody on the show, but I'm curious because I've had a theory on this. We're seeing attention spans get shorter, right? Through like short form content, uh, TikTok, stuff like that. I've also been thinking search has been getting, it used to be how to start a vacation rental on Google. Now it's vacation rentals, short-term rentals, or hospitality. Like people are just searching little phrases, Smoky Mountains. Do you think search is getting granular and like really, really more narrowed in as time moves on? Or are people still looking for that longer places to eat in Smoky Mountains? Or are they saying food, Smoky Mountains. Like, you know what I'm saying? If that makes sense. Yeah. On the, yeah. No, what you're saying, what, what you're saying definitely makes sense. And I think that um, to answer the question, we'd have to know the, the cohort that we're answering the question for. And so I think that over time habits change both with individuals mm-hmm. or even generations, but then new generations come along and new individuals come along and habits are completely different for them and other generations move on. And so I think that there's that aspect to it. But when we look at like actual search data, there are more keywords right now being used to enter sites than ever before. So it's not like we have everybody using the same 19 keywords now. It's it's still hundreds of thousands of different keywords that are being used to enter, like say smokymountains.com in a in a given year. So the long tail is still incredibly long. Not to say that there's not tons of people that are are searching those head terms that are the, yeah. the more like two and three uh, word phrases. Gotcha. Okay. That's yeah. always so, something I was like playing around with. And I was like, all right, David's the guy I gotta ask. You know? like, yeah, I, I mean if you really want to go granular on that, there's a lot of tools that you could use. So like Ahrefs is a good one. And you can go into that tool and you can start to see every single keyword that a site ranks for, the positions they rank for, and then about how much traffic are coming in, you know, comes into the site through that. And it'll start to tell a pretty interesting story about that uh, exact question. And, and you can actually start to look at it for like Airbnb in one area or smokymountains.com or whoever it is. Yeah. Okay, that makes more sense. I'll write that down. What was that again for any of the listeners that want to look it up? Yeah, it's Ahrefs. I'll send you the link so you can stick it in okay. the, the show notes. Too. Cool. Have you heard about our friends at Safely? Well, Safely integrates perfectly with your tech stack in order to make sure that you are covered while your guests occupy the vacation home. Now, this is different from business insurance and, of course, homeowners insurance. But this is the best solution out there that's actually underwritten by a real insurance provider to cover vacation rental operator pros just like you. So damaged linens, broken glass, ruined couches, you name it, stuff like that, or maybe even an accident on the property is covered by Safely. All you need to do is take pictures of the damages and make sure that you find a replacement item in order to cover what has been broken or destroyed. Now, this is super great because your homeowners are going to be happy that they're not going to see reduced damage items on their owner statement. You just take care of it. Don't have to hassle the guests and you don't have to see lower income for your homeowners. This is a great retention tool and we love using Safely in my business as well. So now that you've heard about Safely, we're back to the episode and thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, so now you created this product. Let's, talk, let's jump into this. You're creating this product that helps kind of aggregate the integrations and doing everything. So correct me if I'm wrong. Is this stay sense? This is stay sense, right? Yeah. So, so stay sense right. is like our parent company. The, the, 
that came about because all of a sudden we realized this is really stupid to tell somebody in Destin they need to opt into SmokyMountains.com for our Florida's properties to populate down here in Florida. So we're like, we, we need some kind of name that's an umbrella above this. So we don't really for do sure. anything with the the StaySense.com brand too much. It's more of like a holding brand that holds everything else. Uh, you know, it does have the different sections of the product that we we launched back in 2018. So we called all of the listing sites along with the DMO product, the StaySense Amplify product line when we named it back in 2017 or 18. But basically more or less, it's just, it's these are the, the different listing sites and we needed a parent company umbrella up above it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I'm on the same track now. Um, so I guess walk us through what's next. Give me the high level overview. Obviously, like you said, you're getting into different markets from Hawaii to Florida, Smoky Mountains. How big is this going to get? Are you hitting every single destination? What's your guys' goal and mission with this? Yeah, so I think so difficult to tell the future, you know, and figure out what's going to yeah. happen in 2023. Uh, we were having this conversation here at the office, you know, this uncertainty in 2023. And I'm thinking, when has there not been uncertainty? Yes, there's going to be challenges in 23. And I'm pretty sure we're as well equipped as anybody to deal with those challenges. And we'll have fun along the way. But I can't like pull out a crystal ball and tell you exactly like how many we're going to open in the next 24 months or something like this. I can tell you this. We are absolutely just dialed in on making Florida and Hawaii as big of successes or bigger than SmokyMountains.com. That's like priority one for me. Priority two is this, this new product that we're going to take to the different DMOs, the CVBs that are out there, because these places have sometimes tens of millions of dollars of traffic flowing across their site with no bookable vacation rentals right now. Some of them have vacation rental links where it takes you over to a vacation rental website and loses people along the way when you start to dig into the competitive intelligence around these, these different brands. But there's not like bookable vacation rentals, for example, on Gatlinburg.com today. Yeah. And we can solve that. We've already solved that. We have a prototype out of, that's out live. We have our first customer that's already signed. And we have people that are very excited about this, having only done a few pitches, every single DMO we've talked to is like, okay, we need this, we're ready, we're ready to go. And so what that does is these are taxpayer funded entities a lot of times. And so this allows the property manager to then distribute to a highly trafficked website and get bookings either free of charge or at a fraction of the charge of a normal listing site. And it allows those travelers that are hitting the website right now that then have this really disjointed and frustrated booking experience to have a much better booking experience where they aren't having to go to 32 sites, which is the same thing they can do on Google. And so yeah. this actually empowers the DMO to do what it's supposed to do, which is really represent the businesses there well. And so that's like, when I think about how we could spread fast, that's technology, that's scalable. That's maybe what I'm most passionate about in 2023 and what like I'm putting the majority of my time into this year and, and moving forward, most likely. So that's the single biggest like excitement point, if you will. Well, you're solving one of the biggest issues and probably the most annoying issues that nobody's wanted to solve because that's the number one thing I've heard. I actually just had a conversation the other day. Everyone's like, okay, DMOs, chambers, they all serve the hotels and restaurants, which is great. But no one cares about us because they either think we're not professional and right. we don't have like high standards like a hotel or we don't pay exactly. taxes, which is right. false. There's very few people I would say that get away with not paying lodging tax while running a vacation rental management company from one to 10 homes, I would say even. So the fact that you guys are able to come in there and actually have the DMOs be able to do what they're supposed to do not only with restaurants and hotels, but within vacation rentals, that's huge. It's really, really huge because it is the most biggest, like I used to be completely anti like DM. I was like, oh, they don't do shit. Excuse my language. But I was like, they don't do shit for the city or the country or whatever the state right. that they're in. And all they do is promote and make us have all this crap in our lobby or whatever it is. And now after years of getting to experience it a little bit differently, have seen that it does work, but you're saying it's just links. And a lot of people get lost from going to one site, finding a property they love, but then having to click a link just to rediscover it all over again on a booking engine through whatever platform people are using. 
and yeah it just completely dilutes the experience and now you guys are like i'm really amped up about this this is pretty big like you're the yeah. only ones i've heard of doing this either no, we're, we're really, uh, we're really excited about it. When we started the project, we called it LSAS or, or LSAS or listing sites as a service. That's how it like started out. Like when we were yeah. coming up with the idea, what if we could just spin up another listing site Then we could spin them up for ourselves as well as other people. And as the idea formulated over time, we were looking at, okay, who would be the customer and who would, who would actually benefit from this? How can we, how can we help the stakeholders in our industry? And so over time, it turned into this, what it is today, which is primarily what we believe will be high trafficked individual websites and that are individually owned. So like an example out in the Smoky Mountains would be pigeonforge.com. A lady named Jessica owns that. That would be an example of, she's not a customer yet. Hopefully she will be after she listens to this podcast. There's my oh, she will. Uh, and Yeah, yeah, for sure. So once she hears how I'm hanging out with Will, it's all done. <laughs> uh, and so she's over here, we have like that, that's for profit, which is still good for a property manager out there. Because again, anytime you can take your distribution strategy and spread it out across more rather than fewer companies, then Airbnb doesn't hold all the power or Verbe doesn't hold all the power or my brand doesn't hold the power. It's spread out and it gives that buying power, if you will, to the individual property management company that they wouldn't have if it was them up against one company. And so that's a good thing when it happens on a site like pigeonforge.com, but it's an even better thing if we can put it on a site like visitmysmokies.com or gatlinburg.com and these different CVBs and DMOs that are out there and get them actually free bookings, which is my, my end goal with this is to do that. And it's good for the CVB and DMO as well, because they can prove that they actually drove value this way. Now, the question that that you brought up that they've also brought up is, hey, what about hotels? And a lot of these areas, hotels pay more taxes than vacation rentals. And so they're better at lobbying than us. It's an older industry than us. And so what I tasked my team with uh, behind me here uh, is we need a pitch that's true and that is so compelling that the general manager of a Hilton or a Marriott will walk in there and make the pitch for me. And so like, that's what we've been working on, which is basically some of the exact pain points you were talking about. Hotels really, some of the hatred for the vacation rental industry and short-term rental industry came about because they felt it was an unlevel playing field. And yeah. so by making sure if you come onto this, this DMO product or this, this product that you pay your taxes and you comply with the required inspections and those things, we've leveled that playing field in essence. And whether or not, that's something that was already more level than they realized. It reinforces it is a level playing field today in 2023 and gets them more excited about it to where all of a sudden hotels are on board with this as well. And they're playing together rather than fighting each other and lobbying each other out of existence because that's what usually will probably, well, would probably happen if that's the route everyone kept going. One point I want to bring up about this, I was writing it down and it was making me think, we recently did the book direct show this last year in Miami and book direct show isn't anti OTA as Damian Sheridan would always say. He's like, it's not anti, like we had Hopper as one of the, the sponsors mm -hmm. with the booth there and stuff. What I like about this is because a book direct doesn't mean building your own website and having a booking engine and doing all this stuff that a lot of vacation rental managers or even hoteliers don't know how to do. They're just like, I don't know. I'm good at, turning over a property, whether it's a room or a, uh, a home and making sure that my guests are happy. That's my job. I'm not a tech guy. I'm not a person that does this, but what you guys are building, whether it's through the DMO stuff or if it's through creating specific destination sites that are driving traffic to these properties is that you're actually giving the property manager more control than let's say Airbnb or Verbo would allow which is the whole point of the book direct movement It's more control. So that way you can own the guest rather than kind of question like, all right, I'm paying all this money and this guest fee or this hosting fee, you know, how do I know this is going to work and how can I use this to grow my business in a profitable, sustainable way? You guys are like a great, sorry if I feel like I'm plugging you guys, but it's just like, I love no, how you can, you can keep doing in. that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, for the listeners, I'm like, I don't want this to sound like I'm, like trying to sell this, but I passionately get excited about, you know, businesses that make impact, yes, and guest experience, but this comes full circle with everything from the manager, to the owner, to the destination, you name it. That's where I get really excited. So I guess my point is you guys are really building something that isn't, 
I wouldn't call you a listing site or quote unquote OTA. It's it's really a another reliable source for these hosts and managers to have ownership of their actual business rather than just being on another site. Yeah, man, I, I appreciate that. I think really like w- when we think about strategy and when we think about like how it's shaped into what it is, I can't ignore the the years I spent on the property manager side of the table. And yeah. so when I have somebody that's new, that's starting for me as a, a software engineer, for example, I'll tell them, hey, you know, when somebody's writing in, they're really upset. It's one of our property managers. What you need to understand is they may not really be that upset about the photo that's loading that way. They're probably upset about the owner that's wearing them out on the other end that they manage a multi-million dollar asset for with a lifetime value probably of that client of a few hundred thousand dollars. That's what they're actually upset about. And so like, I can understand those things and hopefully my team can understand those things, you know, through only one degree of separation from that seat at a given time and also being able to filter that for them through those lenses. But, uh, you know, I do think that book direct is something I've been passionate about for a very long time. That surprises some people, but then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of peel back just one layer and say, hey, my whole brand started out as a book direct brand. When you really think about yeah. it, SmokyMountains.com, we were a property manager. We happened to be really, really good at book direct and turned into uh, an OTA, basically. And we were so, so good, we became we became a channel for everybody else. We're, we're like, we'll become the enemy. No, uh, <laughs> but it's like, you know, I love talking book direct with people. I think that I do think that one of the important things to understand about book direct that often gets glossed over is that a book direct booking isn't a free booking in the same way that Airbnb or my company or whoever doesn't have a hundred percent profit margins. So I think sometimes inaccurately people look at it like, okay, if it's, let's say it's a 15% commission, they view that as the potential savings. What Hilton can tell you, and you could go read about their book direct campaigns and Marriott can tell you, and you can read about theirs is oftentimes you'll spend that same 15% on a direct booking. I can assure you we did with smokymountains.com when we were in property management, but we were building a sustainable brand throughout that process. And so I think that mentality shift of rather looking at this as, Hey, I'm going to save 15% by getting a, a direct booking. Instead, look at, I'm going to invest this 15% into building a powerful brand here that's here and sustainable and going to be here for the long haul. And that's where property managers can really uh, look at this through the correct lens, but also win long term. Yeah, we've had multiple conversations on this podcast with like Andrew McConnell from Rented. You know, the one thing he always says is 15% the first time, but with an OTA, it's continually having that 15% with the same guests that you shouldn't have to pay that 15% on versus when you get to the book direct. It might be 15%, but then that 15% becomes lower the more they stay with you. If exactly. we, have, we have one guest who messaged us on Airbnb, shoot, like last week, two weeks ago, and he's like, oh, I stayed at your property in West Seattle, want to book it again. Do you know if the weather has made an impact? And I was like, yeah, we'd love to, one, tell you the weather's great. We're totally fine. The windstorm didn't hit us, whatever. But hey, guess what? that guidebook that you got has a link to our site where you can actually save a little bit of money. Here's a code, go book dire- there directly. Now, Airbnb, if you're listening, I'm sorry, don't kick me off. But um, yeah, you know, that's also like a simple thing you can do, but that now if they ever come back, they're always going to go back to that site rather than Airbnb exactly. versus with you guys. Like, you know, it's, it's the same method, right? It's just different delivery. And yeah, I think it's way more important to understand book direct isn't zero commission. It's, like you said, reinvesting it. There's a real time or a real monetary cost to build any book direct brand, but it's a worthwhile investment. And that's really, it's not like a a this or that with how I view it. Like when when we had smakeymountains.com, we were about 50% book direct by choice and 50% Mm -hmm. by OTA. And that was a a risk diversification methodology because if we were 100% book direct and we likely could have been with our search traffic, but let's say something that happens to that search traffic, a slight hiccup or whatever, then you're just really in trouble versus if you have eight other listing sites over here that make up your other 50%, 50% book direct, one, you get a higher ADR because it's additional demand, but two, you've, you've taken a lot of risk out of the equation. I love that. That's a great comparison. I know I told you before we jumped on the recording, we are doing this new thing this year and so far it's been well received from the listeners, but we have the guest before you ask a question for the guest after them, if that makes sense. So last 
episode as we're recording this is Robin Craigett from Moving Mountains oh, nice. who was on the show and got to actually record with him in person here in Steamboat. And his question for the next guest, not knowing who you were, I didn't tell him, hey, David's going to be on the show. He said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the context with that is what's the end goal for your business? And you kind of actually kind of covered this throughout the episode, but I will leave it to you to answer that question of what do you want to be when you grow up? What's the end goal? Yeah. So love Robin. Uh, Great, great question. And if you haven't seen his company, definitely go check it out. If you're listening to this, it's one of the more impressive vacation rental companies in, in North America, I'd say. What I want to be when I grow up is somebody that makes a difference. And that's somebody that makes a difference on vacations like we've been talking about. It's also somebody that makes a difference in my employees' life, in my children's lives, in my community. And so, like, if there's something I want to do, it's make more of a difference. How do I do that? You know, I'm still figuring that out. There's a lot of different things in each avenue of life that, that I haven't figured out yet that I'm trying to figure out but I want to make more of a difference and positively impact others around me. And basically, you know, at the end of my life, that's, that's more important than accumulating more or anything else. Those things are nice, but like really making a difference in people's lives is, is where it's at for me. I love that. Such a good answer. And now without knowing who the next guest is, what would be your question for them? I would say what person that you've never met, has influenced your business the most and why. Mm. All right. Well, whoever our lucky guest is next is going to get it. So get ready. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, David, uh, to go off of uh, another side note before we end the episode, all of our guests submit a guest form. And if they don't do it, I usually tell them you can't be on the show until you do. But David did this a while ago. And I was going through it before our recording today. And this is totally random. So it has nothing to do with what we just talked about. Okay, here we go. <laughs> but I see on your pat, like I asked the question, any specific talking points for the episode that you would like to go over? And one random one in there at the bottom is before this industry, I was a professional pilot for net jets and a, and flew an A-list celebrities or and flew A-list celebrities and CEOs on the fastest certified passenger jet in the world at a cost of over $20,000 per hour. What? Yeah. The hell? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, it, gosh, yeah. So basically, <laughs> so the answer is yeah. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, yeah. It was it was a really good gig. I flew for NetJets. As far as aviation goes, it was about the best career you could have out there. I knew my schedule a year in advance. I worked nineteen weeks a year, and uh, they they treated us really really well. And we'd go out there, we'd fly these different people, you know, all kinds of different people that were just cool to be able to meet and talk to. But then, uh, you know, the best part about it was we were flying really, really cool equipment. And then we were staying in nice places and seeing the world and then had most of our time off, which was really, really nice. Um, yeah. And, you know, that was actually uh, that career, which required a college degree, was what caused me to found Speedy Prep, which was, was the educational technology, our first company that we exited because you had to have a college degree to get on uh, with NetJets. And I was wow. trying to build my flight time, flight instructing others and going through flight school, which didn't count like as a whole college degree. It counted some towards it, but not as the whole thing. I figured out the, all these like hacks, if you will, for these different tests that would count towards an accredited college degree. And so mm-hmm. then basically what uh, kind of shut the the flying story down was that that first business got to be such a big success that we were like, okay, why am I leaving my newborn son and my wife behind to go fly again? And, you know, maybe we should just dial in on this business and and really figure that out. And so after working to get to the kind of the very top of an aviation career, we decided to go ahead and uh, hit the exit and just focus in on the the business world. See, I wish I asked that question in the beginning. I was like, man, I didn't know that. That's insane. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. So cool. We could do like a whole nother episode on that, but I know, uh, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty impressive. You got a cool story, David. I really genuinely think like it's a really cool story. Not a lot of times you get to sh- you know, have people on that share that type of experience and route and path to the industry, but super cool. I love it. 
Well, thanks, man. It's been uh, it's been awesome joining you here and uh, look forward to seeing you again in person uh, soon. Hopefully here in Nashville, you come out for the the show in March. Uh, I think we're yes, having sir. A, awesome. Yes, awesome. sir. Yeah, I will awesome see you at SCR Wealth. Here we come. Nashville. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, no, thank you, David, again, so much for being on the show. All of our listeners, if you liked anything from this podcast, all of David's links are in the show notes. Everything you need to know about him, how to get in touch, the companies he's building all right there so thank you for listening and tuning in and we'll see you all again next week thank you so much for listening and thank you to our show partners for making slick talk the hospitality podcast possible we hope you enjoyed the show and we would love to connect with you outside of the podcast so you can follow us on all of our social media channels for daily hospitality content or find us on slicktalkthepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and we will see you guys all again next week. What's up, Slick Talkers? This episode is brought to you by my friends at Hostfully, and their property management software is the best-in-class solution for hosts and managers alike. They integrate with the best tech solutions out there like operation software, dynamic pricing, insurance, noise monitoring, you name it, they've got it. And guess what? You can also get their digital guidebook solution as well in order to make sure you aren't printing out or writing down guidebook and activities and house manual items for your guests. All you need to do is create their digital guidebook, link it with the property management software, and voila, you're ready to rock and roll getting your guests in and out with a breeze. So make sure you check out the link in the show notes in order to get our special offer for all of our listeners. And now back to the episode.